Great, thanks. Appreciate it, Bobby. So, um, yeah, so today's focus is really on uh, AI XPU scale up. So, for those of you actually uh, come to my talk in the morning, so there are a few slides are similar, but uh, I think in the afternoon I'll focus just on the scale up. So, again, this is uh, uh, at least our world view of what the GAI data center going to look like. Um, so, basically, compared to like four or five years ago, uh, this AI um, gonna uh, add a significant uh, amount of uh, networking um, to the data center. So you can see in, uh, uh, in the lower part, this is really where uh, lots of these AI GPU servers, they're gonna get interconnected. Actually, in the so-called back end, there are actually two set of networks. One is so-called scale-up network, really, uh, is a high, very high bandwidth domain where you tie together many GPUs, so we can treat each of these uh, rectangle block. Uh, could be you know eight GPU, could be seventy-two, uh, could be you know a few hundred. So you treat them as a super GPU. So this is so-called uh, scale-up network, and this is where I'm going to focus my talk uh, in the next few minutes. And obviously, just commenting on you know further scale up because these days data center are gonna build uh, with many GPUs, you know, tens of thousand GPUs, even to 100,000, and there are some talk even to million GPUs. So obviously, uh, the scaling law still works. Uh, you continue to build larger models, so uh, the data center only get bigger. Uh, in many cases, you have to now start to string together many of these data centers as one. Um, this is just a view to show uh, how you build um, like a SPU these days, and this is not a real, um, but it's more cartoon view of what could be built. And there are many elements already being implemented in uh, state-of-the-art uh, GPU servers. Uh, so if you focus on the most uh, bandwidth-intensive portion, this is really what we call a SPU scale up. Uh, I, I put a red circle there. Uh, this is really tens of uh, terabit per second uh, bandwidth needed. Uh, as an example, like the GB200 uh, released by NVIDIA, they require 7.2 terabit per second. Next generation, like Lubin, are very likely going to easily double that bandwidth to maybe 14 terabit per second per GPU. So this is really high bandwidth domain. I think this is a fertile area for optical innovations and solve customer problems. So one of the problems to solve is um, uh, if you actually go to the floor, to the Meta booth, they're basically showing uh, Catalina, a new system there, it's so-called MVL72 equivalent. So this is the media largest uh, super GPU, so to speak, uh, cramp, like 72 GPU into one a rack, but uh, in the back of that rack, you actually see like 5,000 copper cable there. So that's how they actually get uh, a build these days, uh, but obviously with this continued large language model scaling, you actually have very strong incentive to scale up to much larger size of super GPUs with optics, uh, by the way, because uh, with the speed now at 200 gig uh, per, per lane, it's very difficult to scale copper beyond like two, three meters, even with active copper cables. So this is the focus of today's talk is, is how do we help with the scaled up optics uh, with high reliability, uh, lower cost, and low power and high bandwidth. Uh, again, very important is bandwidth density is what's driving uh, these applications. Um, I actually borrowed one chart from IA Labs. Uh, I think they published a report recently, um, which is really to show uh, when you're actually scaling up with more GPU, in this case, they actually use their I OIO uh, to scale to 256 uh, GPU versus uh, like CT4 or lower numbers. So you can see the curve, the blue curve really moving up, uh, which is good, right? In the, in the vertical axis, that should show how profitable you can be with your GPU in terms of generating tokens per second, but also given the power constraints. Uh, but on a horizontal axis, it's actually scalability to support uh, interactive uh, with, with users because you're going to have a lot more user now going to the inferencing applications and where you need to support many tokens per second and you need to go 
beyond certain threshold to support so-called machine-to-machine agent-like uh, um, applications. So they show you can do four times better if you actually scaled up uh, four times more GPU. So this is a very interesting study. I certainly encourage uh, the community to do more of this kind of studies. But in a nutshell, basically you want to build larger GPU clusters. So like I said, uh, high reliability is really, really important. Uh, so this is our data to show, you know, with silicon photonics, we, we've been shipping now um, as part of the community to start really shipping in volume. And this is important because uh, reliability not just coming from laboratory testing, but really had to go out and test in the field. So we basically already shipped like three billion device hours in the last few years. Uh, this is actually give us a free rate uh, much less than uh, one. So that, that's actually a good number or encouraging number to start. And certainly with you know, more accumulative uh, data, we're going to show uh, with silicon photon, you can get really good reliability. So uh, that's hopefully not one of the bottlenecks. Uh, optical cost, uh, I think as a community, I think industry has been doing our job in the last uh, 15, 20 years, supporting you know, generations of data center connectivities. And this is a data set uh, I borrow from Light Counting uh, with their permissions to really show what the uh, dollar per gigabit actually trending down over the last few decades with many generations of optical product. So the key number here to remember at the bottom here is, is a 0.1 dollar per gigabit. And this is a good number uh, several times mentioned by the end users say, you know, uh, optical solution really had a hit this type of order of magnitude numbers, but I think we're actually getting awfully close. I, I think if you're looking at it with the data rate increase and laying increase uh, in optics, uh, we are actually trending quite close. So I don't think optical cost itself is no longer, it's really a bottleneck these days. Um, energy, uh, so we already heard several, actually two previous speakers talking about uh, eliminating DSP really can help us, uh, which is, really one of the key new innovations uh, in the last couple of years uh, as a community we've been working on is uh, if you manage the engineering the system correctly, you can actually have a more of a step jump down uh, for power. So here is showing compared to the fully retimed, uh, showing on the red line here, uh, basically you can hit about 15 uh, picojoule per bit. But if you really go to the linear optics, uh, again, with a bar rate increase uh, in a 200 gig generation, you can actually hit about six. So that's actually getting awfully close uh, to even um, some of these uh, more advanced CPO uh, options. And this is just a demonstration we did recently with uh, OIF. Um, so there are many pluggable suppliers coming together and doing demonstration. Uh, these optics actually work well and uh, in the real system, like a real Tomahawk 5 uh, gray switches, and you can get very, very nice performance. To some extent, even better than uh, fully retined pluggable because these uh, switch ASIC is so powerful in terms of their processing capabilities. So um, to move this uh, linear optics to scale up, uh, obviously we're gonna need a lot higher density, a lot higher bandwidth. So uh, in the morning talk, uh, actually you may already have some of the uh, contributions from the community is uh, uh, copper connector itself is, is a very big uh, area for innovation. Uh, so there are multiple contributions now to show uh, just so-called co-packaged copper. Basically you have a very high performance connector with very high density. You can co-package with ASIC. Uh, the nice thing about that is now you can bring those high density interfaces out with very low loss. Um, so you can actually support pluggable in the front panel where you have more freedom to innovate. Uh, for example, to uh, use the higher degree of integrated uh, photonics, uh, 16 lanes, 32 lanes, uh, however many lanes you, you actually like to put in. And uh, there's another area of innovation is uh, pluggable has been perceived as really dodgy old technology for 20 years. Uh, which is true, but uh, from an engineering point of view, there's no reason why you had to stick to whatever this pluggable pedal car has been, you know, gold fingers, has been serving us uh, in the last 20 years. So there is momentum in industry 
for us to also reinvent what the optical pluggable is because there's no reason you cannot plug in you know, 32 channels of silicon photonic inside a pluggable optic. Uh, so I think these are the, uh, some of the areas I think as a community we're going to continue to work on and I think uh, may be able to uh, uh, meet the right challenges here to uh, climb up the steps like every two years, going to double it again. Um, and if we had to move to CPO, I think we need to prepare for that eventually. Uh, if you really need to move optics so close to the ASIC. Um, so we certainly strongly advocate for a more open uh, ecosystem type of CPO where you can actually take advantage of these really high performance, very high density connectors where you can actually innovate on what goes into the CPO uh, rather than tie down with a completely vertical integrated system uh, with very little flexibility in terms of configuration, in terms of supporting multiple technology, in terms of actually repair and replace. Once you solder down, it's going to be really difficult to service. So uh, again, we, we've been working with the OIF EI community to see if we can propose uh, a newer version uh, of mountable or pluggable CPOs. Uh, there was an older version of uh, OIS CPO, but it's out of date. It's like with a full retime and it's very limited lanes. So I think there will be opportunity there for us to uh, innovate as well. And by the way, we can further integrate uh, thin film lithium now based on silicon as a platform. So it's not just silicon, silicon alone. I, th I think this allows us to actually incorporate newer material, newer systems into you know, silicon photonic platform or generalize the silicon photonic platform. Uh, there's also uh, uh, just a quick comment about the OCS because this is a, a very uh, good topic and there's lots of discussion. How do we scale up uh, uh, SPUs nicely? So there's real world example. Uh, some of the hyperscaler already started deploy uh, with OCS. Uh, obviously from the uh, interface point of view, uh, you actually uh, will desire to use uh, copper, or mix of copper and optics, because uh, within the rack, if you can continue to use copper, you use copper. Uh, but to scale to like thousands of GPUs or XPUs, uh, certainly optics uh, is a very essential, and you had to have it. Um, now, a little bit of trade-off here is uh, OCS itself do lose power, right? You have insertion loss there, so they're typically about three dBs of loss you had to deal with. So you had to design a better performance uh, transceiver there with a higher link budget. So this is an example actually Google uh, published in their paper uh, showing you know, one of the transceivers uh, where you do support this extra link loss, but also you use by dye to actually minimize use of fiber. So basically a single fiber going by direction on a single fiber. So that way you can save uh, OCS ports because you can use one port to go by direction. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, I think there are major opportunities for uh, scale up uh, optics and you know, uh, as a community we like to support with multiple technologies and uh, I think right now silicon photonics certainly is very promising and I do see you know, lithium ion bay, BTO, even polymer, there's lots of material system actually uh, the R&D community is working on. Uh, but all of these can be incorporated into the generalized silicon photonic platforms. So that's a good news, uh, I think, can carry us forward. And then, you know, linear optics, I think, is very promising, particularly for scale up. Um, and then, you know, we certainly like to, uh, let's just say, innovate out of the box because uh, right now there's a little bit polar debate between CPO and pluggable. I think there could be a range of combinations where. Uh, if we innovate it together, I think we will find the right solutions. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Um, if you have any questions, please step up to the microphone. Please say a little more about how you mount the mountable CPO, what you sacrifice for greater, say, accessibility and repairability. Uh, engineering is always about constraint, right? So uh, I think the key factor here is uh, we need to deliver uh, certain form factor, certain density, and 
certain loss uh, within those engineering constraints. So I would say one terabit per millimeter is a good goal to hit. Uh, so it's very desirable to hit that goal. And then in terms of uh, uh, how close you need to move to the ASIC, and uh, that's a very much, again, another design constraint, right? So that basically, I'll tell you how many of uh, these mountable uh, CPL can be implemented per, uh, I guess, ASIC. Uh, but I think I've seen some examples showing uh, by Peter, for example. I think that there are examples there. I think we can meet those requirements if you can cleverly design a 2D footprint rather than just 1D footprint. Uh, so there's good room there for uh, growth and scaling. Thank you. Any other questions? Would you mind uh, step up onto the microphone so we can uh, can be pick up? So when do you hit cost parity at these densities with copper? When does that? Uh, I don't think that's the that goal. Uh, I, I think that's a false assumption. Okay. Uh, the clear reason is there, there are really two reasons. One is. Optics certainly solve problems copper cannot solve. So from value point of view, you can't just equate optics with copper. That's just a no, go no starter because that's just not what optical would like to do. I think optics generate extra value. That's, that's why I showed that chart, right? If you can scale much more GPUs and you can generate money for a customer, that's where the money coming from. So we like to say, you had to hit right cost, but not zero cost or copper cost. That's not what we compete. So you can't compete with copper weight by tons and say optics cap have to cost the same, right? So at the end of the day, the cost had to be the right cost to generate profit for customers. So I hear what you're saying, but what does the cost point ratio have to be for the extra value to be accepted by the people who actually pay for these systems? So the first number I will show is, is uh, do, you sh do you actually cost very significant fraction of GPUs? So that GPU today costs you tens of thousand dollars. Now, that's a room you, I, I would say in, in a big picture, you should not cost much more than that GPU, well, fraction of that GPU. That's a number you should look at, right? Because at the end of the day, optics, help customer utilize those GPU a lot more efficiently. So if you say I hook up 256 rather than 72, customer can squeeze out 30%, 50% more GPU power. That's the cost saving we provide to customer. Now, our optics gonna cost a lot less than those value we bring to customer. So that's really where you need to look at. Not artificial numbers say you had to be certain X of copper, right? Again, look at the value you generate, not like cost compared to something very different. So doesn't that discussion become complex? Yes, it is complex. So that's why I show that system value chart. I think the community need to do that, right? Showing how you can generate value with different solutions. Therefore, a customer willing to pay for it. So. The IA lab uh, re analysis, I think, is great analysis. I, I encourage more people doing that because that's how it shows the value, right? You generate four times more profit, four times more customer you can support. That's the money customer willing to pay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, good discussion. It's a complicated question. Yes, thank you. Any more questions? Uh, if not, thank you, Ryan. Thank you.